Folks, you're going to love today's Light of the Southwest. It's none other than a longtime GLC favorite. It is Avi Lipkin right there in the GLC studios. And I'm coming to you from Amarillo. How are you, Avi? Ter terrific. Uh, I heard that you love snow and you, you just didn't want to go up to Denver. So you, you, <laughs> you told God to set it up in Texas. Well, you know, you know, I, I was, it's like I said on the phone earlier, Avi, I, I was joking with, with the Lord, but, you know, some way, somehow, you know, Amarillo, I mean, yesterday they had uh, T-shirts and shorts, and today it's a blizzard. Uh, who would have thought? But that's the panhandle. But, you know, Avi, you are no stranger to unusual weather. Because you travel all around the United States. You've spoken in thousands of churches and synagogues and so many websites that you're on. Folks, Google Avi Lipkin. You can see what he's about. Of course, I got to interview your son, too. He's a new friend, and we, we share some musical tastes as well. But, Avi, I'm very honored to talk with you today because, as you well know, there are things happening uh, that the world is, 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 is consumed with. It is the Ukrainian war uh, with Russia and how that affects Alia. So with none further ado, catch us up on what you're doing and what this situation means to you. Okay, well, what it means to me is mostly, most important of all, uh, as a Jew and as an Israeli, uh, how is this going to affect Aliyah to Israel? And the statistics that we have at this time is that there are about 150,000 uh, people in the Ukraine who could qualify for Aliyah. Uh, 50,000 are Jews, uh, pure Jews in the sense that no intermarriage with Christians, but 100,000 are people who are half Jewish, half Christian, or 75, 25%. Um, so they're not necessarily Jewish, and in many cases they are not Jewish, but they have enough Jewish blo blood to go to the gas chambers under Hitler so they have enough Jewish blood to move to Israel. So <clears throat> there are about 150,000 in the Ukraine. Uh, and very interestingly, uh, nobody's looking at this, there are half a million in Russia of Jews and Jews with Christian uh, spouses and blood. Um, and what's happening now uh, is that the El Al flights from Moscow uh, to Israel are full, full, full um, uh, it, it, there's a very big waiting list uh, for people who want to who get out of Russia and escape to Israel. Uh, for people who you know don't want to fly to Israel but they just, they just want to leave, uh, they take the train from uh, Saint Petersburg uh, to um, to Finland, and then from there they travel. And a lot of the uh, people in Russia, a lot of people in the Ukraine, uh, they have been enjoying a tremendous amount of prosperity in the last 10, uh, 20 years. And uh, so you have, for example, uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, our prime minister, went to uh, Sinai to Sharm el-Sheikh to meet with the Egyptian President Sisi. And uh, they were talking about increasing Jewish uh, tourism to Sinai uh, because the Russians and the Ukrainians had to stop going because of the war. So now all these beautiful, beautiful hotels in Egypt, in other words, in Sinai, are empty, and the the Egyptians are begging Israel to send you know more Israeli tourists uh, to Sinai, and I have to tell you, I served in the army and artillery, Israeli army and artillery in uh, Sinai, and uh, it is so beautiful. It is the the classic uh, experience for tourists from anywhere in the world to go to Egypt. So now, uh, Egypt for the first time is allowing uh, flights. Uh, civilian airliners from Israel to fly down to Sharm el-Sheikh. And uh, there are many, many Israelis now flying, especially with Passover coming up in two weeks. Um, so a lot of uh, Israelis are flying there. So uh, even the, the war in the Ukraine is sending, uh, uh, causing Israelis to travel to Egypt. I mean, it's kind of crazy stuff. Uh, now, but seriously, though, regarding the uh, situation in the Ukraine, uh, one has to uh, study the, the life and the character of uh, Vladimir Putin. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are few, I'm going to tell you a few stories about Putin uh, so that you understand. Putin uh, is, a, is a dear friend of Jewish people. Uh, he is not an anti-Semite whatsoever, you know. So, uh, for example, when, when his, uh, this is before he was born, um, his mother and father were in uh, Leningrad, which is today St. Petersburg, 
and the city was surrounded by the Nazis, and there was terrible starvation in uh, uh, Leningrad. And one day Putin's father uh, comes home from the front or from wherever he was, and uh, they told him that his wife, Putin's mother, had just died. And so uh, he said, well, where's the body? You know, so I can go and bury her. So they said, oh, there's a mound of bodies just outside there. So he went out to the mound of bodies, and he couldn't recognize anyone, but what he recognized was his wife's shoes. Uh, Putin's mom was wearing certain shoes that the father recognized. He just saw the feet. So when he saw the shoes, he pulled the body out of the mound, and it turned out she was starving, but she was still alive. <sighs> and so Putin's father picked her up in his arms and took her home and, you know, revived her. And, and then Putin came to the world. But Putin's memory uh, is indelibly charged with a story about the starvation of the Russians during the Nazi uh, World War II. Wow. Then when uh, Vladimir Putin was a little kid, um, you know, his parents both worked. And there was no food in the house. That's Russia. And um, I don't know how or, you know, what the circumstances were, but uh, Putin was adopted by all these Jewish children and mothers, you know, who loved Vladimir Putin. And I, I, th I mean, I, he's a handsome guy, you know, so he was probably cute when he was a little kid. And uh, the Jewish mothers doted on him. And the Jewish mothers were constantly feeding him. Uh, the Jewish mothers would buy him clothes because he didn't have clothes. I mean, they, in the communist system, uh, unless you knew how to manage, there was great poverty. Right. Uh, and so Putin uh, has good memories of the Jews. He has very bad memories of the Nazis. Um, and, uh, well, you know, he was a KGB officer uh, and, uh, in East Germany. And then uh, in 1990, 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, he p followed after Yeltsin uh, and became the leader of Russia for the last 22 years. Um, you know, I have to tell you, I, uh, until uh, Putin <laughs> went south with this war uh, regarding the Ukraine, um, you know, I kind of tried to overlook his uh, despotism and tyranny as a Russian uh, dictator in the traditions of a thousand years of Russian history. Right. Uh, but Putin actually, um, with all the corruption and all the oligarchs and everything, all these billions and billions of dollars of corruption, but um, the Russian people actually began to have uh, not, a, uh, not a bad life in Russia. And... Um, uh, I think one of the, the revolutions w which Putin never really understood was the high tech. And uh, Russian people are constantly, constantly on the computer, at least they were, and uh, Russian uh, young people, uh, I, see I'm a dinosaur, so, but you take Aaron or you, for example, you guys are on the internet all the time. Russians are on the internet all the time. Uh, the Ukrainians are on the internet all the time. And once you're on the internet, you know what's going on in the West in the US, in Britain, in uh, Europe. And, you know, Russians are no different than other human beings in that they want to have a good life. They want to be able to provide for their families. And uh, I would say, you know, Russians are very patriotic people, but uh, I, I think that had the Russians known the truth that this was not a special military operation, that this was a war. And not only was it a war, it was a uh, ethnic cleansing of the Ukrainians, uh, destroying entire cities. I think the Russians would have rose up in revolt, but what happened was that the, the uh, Putin uh, henchmen and everything shielded Putin from the truth and shielded the Russians from the truth. And so Putin made uh, very, very gross mistakes regarding the, the war on the Ukraine. And it's not a foregone conclusion uh, that the Russians are gonna win. And it's not a foregone conclusion that Putin will remain in office because this kind of a mistake, uh, which leads to the death of, at least to this point, the 15,000 Russian soldiers. Let me tell you, Russian families usually have one child per family. And so if they kill a son of a, of a mom and a pa, uh, the mother and the father, they don't want to live anymore. And I think we will be seeing massive demonstrations and blood in the streets in Russia uh, because of the 15,000 dead soldiers. Uh, the mothers and fathers say, you know, we don't, we don't even want to live anymore. 
Um, so I think this is a terrible mistake on the, on the part of uh, Putin. Um, such, such a travesty, such a travesty, Avi, because, you know, it, it's hard to know what to believe. We, we can't even trust our own media uh, here in the West. You know, uh, <clears throat> I spent time with President Sisi's men in Cairo uh, as we worked with the widows and the orphans. Uh, he's the most friendly towards uh, uh, Jewish populations and Christian populations that they've had perhaps in history. Uh, but, uh, you know, even over there, and even in Germany, even in Greece, even in France, they would tell me, your media lies to you. And then you have the, the, the conspiracy theories that turn out to not be uh, such a conspiracy theory with Hunter Biden's laptop and, and the billions of dollars of, of a Ukrainian uh, uh, money laundering that, that is alleged to happen within our, within our own Congress and, and, and politicians and, and, of course, the, the person they're calling the president right now in, in the White House. And so it's very confusing for anyone uh, to know who to trust, who to listen to. Uh, there's even reports of Putin bombing uh, bio bioweapon labs in Ukraine. And so what do you believe? So someone like you with, with ties uh, overseas and, and as involved as you are uh, with, with uh, people in high places, I'm excited to hear. <laughs> tell, us, tell us who to listen to. Tell us who to believe, Avi. Okay. Uh, I will draw a certain conclusion in a few minutes. But with your permission, I'd like to give a little more of uh, history. Uh, don't forget, I'm 73. I was born in 1949. I was born during the Cold War with the Soviets. I studied Russian uh, in, at New York University and later wow. at Hebrew University. Okay. Because, you know, I, my approach always was when you have an enemy, you have to learn about the enemy to defeat the enemy or to right. defend the enemy. So I studied Russian, Russian history. I loved it. But what I do want to say is a lot of what I know and a lot of what I think uh, is because of my upbringing. Uh, see, my grandparents were from Poland, Russia, and uh, Ukraine. Right. And, and they left uh, uh, Russia of that time and Poland, you know, 1924. Um, so this is like 100 years ago, and my family emigrated to Argentina. And uh, actually, Spanish is my mother tongue. I grew up speaking Spanish at home. Wow. I was born in New York. <laughs> uh, I, uh, so my father and mother, rest in peace, had a very, very interesting, very successful auto parts business. They would export American-made auto parts, you know, Ford, Chrysler, Chevrolet. And, you know, I would spend a lot of time in the office with them. And I wasn't really working, but I was with them. And also, we used to travel a lot to Latin America. We used to have uh, businessmen visiting us from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia. And um, one of the things that I'll never uh, forget, indelibly inscribed in my brain in the 1960s, was the military dictatorships. All of Latin America was military dictatorships. And of course, the socialists and the communists were being thrown out of air trans I mean, military air transports over the Atlantic Ocean with no parachute. Uh, that's how the military dealt with the communists. Um, but you look at Latin America today. OK, Venezuela, Cuba are communist countries. Some of the others are socialist, but the elections are free. In other words, people, uh, in spite or because of the corruption, people go and vote. So you, I think it's fair to say that Latin America today uh, is seeing a democratic revolution taking place. Uh, sometimes it is uh, you know, not in the best interest of the United States to have a socialist leader like in Nicaragua or Ecuador or Bolivia, uh, Argentina, who knows where they are. Uh, but the point I'm saying is there are free elections and democracy is the rule in Latin America today, except for Venezuela, Cuba. Uh, by the way, if Putin falls from power, we may be seeing Venezuela and Cuba also leaving communism. Who knows? Uh, if Putin falls from wow. power, uh, the Russians may leave Syria. And you know what happens when that happens? When that happens, ISIS comes back with a ben vengeance. Then Israel has to go in all the way to the Euphrates. I mean, that's, it's not something we want to do. We don't want to do it. In this case, the Russians uh, kind of you know, did Israel a favor uh, by helping Israel not to have to go into Syria uh, to defend the Druze. The Druze are our, our brethren, you know, also. Okay, so that's Argentina. That's Latin America. Um, you look at uh, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet satellite countries. Today they are 
more right-wing and democratic and more Christian uh, than the Western European countries. So the, uh, the, the Judeo-Christian Western civilization and democracy that was spawned by the United States and Britain and Holland, for example, uh, you find this now in East European countries. Uh, nobody talks about Africa. Africa has problems, of course. Every area has problems. But even Africa, because of the high tech and the, the investments going on in Africa, uh, more and more Africans are becoming democratic in their way of thinking. Corruption exists everywhere. Corruption exists in Africa, it exists in Latin America and Europe, it exists in Israel, it exists in America, it exists in Ukraine, it exists in Russia. Corruption is everywhere, some places more, some places less. But what I'm trying to draw the conclusion is I believe that democracy is on the march. And uh, if indeed uh, Putin eventually does get replaced, uh, I am praying, I'm hoping, I'm confident that the Russian people will stand up and say, you know what, we're tired of this autocracy. And uh, one of the things I share when I speak in churches is that uh, 200 years ago in Germany, there was a, uh, a German, actually German Jewish philosopher, Heinrich Heine, who said mm -hmm. that 20, 200 years ago, he said, he said, the world is going to have to choose between the uh, foolishness of the Americans and the despotism and tyranny of the Russians. So the wow. despotism and tyranny of the Russians has been going on for a thousand years. Maybe now because of high tech and computers and international relations between human beings, uh, I think even the Russians are beginning to understand enough is enough with the autocracy. Sa same with Belarus. I mean, it, w the way that Russia goes, Belarus goes. Um, I'll say also another thing. Uh, until the uh, war erupted between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, everywhere I went and everywhere I spoke, you know, every, the news was always talking about the combined threat of China and Russia against America. And what's happening now is Russia is being degraded very systematically. Russia, uh, Putin made a mistake. He unified all of the European countries and NATO to march with the United States. I mean, Biden doesn't even want to march with anybody. <laughs> the, the Europeans are saying, no, you got to lead us. You got to march with us. Um, so I think that uh, we're, we, we are in the process of seeing Russia uh, being degraded eventually militarily and economically. And uh, that will leave China. And I think if China goes ahead and makes the same mistake, which I think the Chinese are going to make the same mistake, so then China will be degraded. The real threat to America is not Russia. The real threat is China because of economics. I don't know if you remember, right. Bill Clinton had on his uh, Oval Office desk, hey, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, so uh, the, Russia is not an economic threat to America. China is. So I think inevitably the showdown will be with China. So you believe that China will attempt to invade Taiwan? I don't know about Taiwan. I think Chinese might be a little more intelligent than that, and they might bide their time to see exactly how the chips uh, fall for Russia. How do you see this playing out, given the, uh, the perceived weakness of this current sitting president? OK, I'm, I'm going to say something very far reaching, OK? Uh, being a, an American is one thing, and also I'm an Israeli. And I've been in Israel 54 years. And one of the things I noted is that the governments of Israel, when they were socialists and they were looking for peace, they got war. And when the governments were Likud and the Likud, you know, people right wing, Likud is like Republicans. And they're saying to the Arabs, you know, if, even if you look at us the wrong way, you're in trouble. And then in the end, it was the Likud that gave up Sinai and the Likud gave up other things also. And, um, you know, let me put it another way. I'm going to draw a very rude parallel. If you have two beautiful ladies, one is dressed like a lady of ill repute, uh, you know what that means, and uh, the other one is dressed up with a karate gi black belt. Uh -huh. And a rapist looks at the two extremely attractive women. Who is he going to go for? Is he going to go for the karate black belt or is he going to go for the one who's dressed up like a lady of ill repute. He's going to go for the lady of ill repute. Right. right. So when you have a president who says, we are not going to attack, and we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that, 
That's the one Putin's going to go after. But I think what happened was, uh, was that Putin fell in a trap. And I would even venture to say that the trap was set by the globalists. In other words, saying, let America have a, a president who has a sign on his back that says, kick me. Right. And then Putin comes and kicks him, and then the whole world jumps on uh, Putin. So in, in your discernment, do you believe that's the case? The yeah. The globalists did set yeah. this up. Yeah, I think that... Uh, Brilliant plan. It worked. Huh? It worked. <laughs> uh, I think it worked, and I think the more... Uh, Putin attacks the Ukraine, the deeper the hole he's digging for himself. Then, so in light of all of this... Then you'll only be left with China. Well, you know, some would say that Russia and China uh, are very embedded in our politics here in America, and uh, they, they control uh, the shots behind the scenes more than some may perceive. Who knows? Well, you know but, what? Let me go back a little bit into European history. Uh, many of the attacks on the Jewish people uh, during the time of the Crusades and in the 1400s and 1500s, what happened was the king would arbitrarily uh, demand money from the people of his country, and uh, so they would become his enemies. And then uh, when, when the king was in trouble, had no money, who did he go to? He went to the Jewish moneylenders. So he made them his allies, but then the people started to hate the Jewish moneylenders because they were giving money to the king that they despised. This is what the Magna Carta was all about. The, 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 the aristocrats in England didn't want Prince John doing whatever he wanted to do. So the, the, that's when they started to reign in the powers of the king. But right. uh, the Magna Carta in 1215 said the Jews were gonna be expelled from England. And the Jews were expelled from England until Oliver Cromwell brought them back with the Protestant Reformation. So what I think we're seeing here is, uh, you know, Russia supposedly, supposedly holds American debt. I don't know about the Russians so much. But what do you do to someone who owns your debt? You kill him. You destroy him. What do you do to a country that owns your debt? You find ways to bring them down so that they don't owe you anymore. Uh, you don't owe them anymore. Right. So I, I think that the, the globalists, I think they know what they're doing on how to bring down Putin and Xi Jinping. Uh, on the surface, we will see more and more democracy everywhere. The whole world eventually, except in Islamic countries, will be totally democratic. In the Islam, there is no democracy. Uh, also, the, the, the Muslim world is not uh, uh, globalist, one world government. They also no. are very nationalist and very religious in their own way. Same with Russia, same with China. They don't want to be part of the globalist system. So the global system is going to crack every nut until they op crack all the nuts. Uh, then you'll have one world government democracy, which means in the end that a small elite controls everything. So some would say that a one world government is right around the corner. I mean, I mean even Robert Mueller uh, was quoted as saying, uh, Bob Mueller, you know, saying we need a one world government and a one world leader as soon as possible. And is it as close as people are, are saying that it is, or, or do you think it's a little ways off, uh, given th these current events? Well, you know, I, uh, I don't want to talk from my own personal experience, but uh, I've been speaking in churches, and I used to speak in synagogues. I don't really speak in synagogues anymore, okay. uh, because nobody wants to hear about the Holocaust that is coming in America to the Jews. I, I mean, we could do a whole show on that. Uh, but the, uh, the, the problem here is that uh, people want to feel good. People want to hear nice things. Everything's okay. Everything's coordinated. And uh, everything's comfortable. The whole world is a uh, country club. Um, and, and people who want to talk about ideologies and uh, especially Islam. You know, Islam says kill the Jews. So if I go into synagogue and say, you know, the Jews in America are going to be slaughtered, then uh, the thing gets shut down. Or if I get up and say, well, you know what? Some of the militias in America are neo-Nazi. A few of them, not, not too many of them. Uh, I can't talk about that, and I can't talk about Black Lives Matter, and I can't talk about Antifa. And all four of these groups hate the Jews. And they're all and, armed. And they have a communist manifesto. Yeah, there's no, uh, you there's know, no God. their websites without to save Islam. Yeah. There's no God, yeah. Well, you know, some have speculated that the one world government would come through a caliphate, a global domination, 
uh, but you're saying that Islam does not believe in the one world government. Um, what would you say to those people? Well, um, for every problem, there is a solution. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'll tell you something. You know that uh, President Trump, to his credit, helped to bring about the Abraham Accords. Right. Now, I moved to Israel in 1968. Uh, the biggest enemy at that time was Egypt. Today, Egypt right. is, is the strongest ally right. uh, in the Islamic world that the Jews have. Jordan is an ally, even though, you know, <laughs> I would say the majority of the Jordanians really don't like Israel or the Jews, but Jordan is an ally. You know, we provide Jordan with all its water. Unbelievable. They, I remember when I moved to Israel in 68, it would say in the Jerusalem Post that in the kitchens in Amman, Jordan, there was water in the taps two days out of the week. Well, now the Jordanians have water in their taps seven days out of the week, and Israel even provides water for 1.4 million Syrian refugees living in Jordan. So, you know, Israel is helping Jordan with a lot of things. There's now uh, a, a tentative agreement uh, to set up solar energy farms in Jordan, and Israel will trade water for uh, electricity. So, again, we have to see if that develops or not. But You know, you know Avi, be, with, with your ties with Israel and, and living there, and um, a lot of people don't know what all Israel does for the world. They do amazing things for the entire world, and they still uh, bless their enemies when there's a national disaster. Could you could you refresh some of our viewers, uh, uh, just some examples of the incredible things that Israel does for everyday people all over the world? Well, uh, that's a big that's a big one. We need a show just for that. But what I well, let, let, let's do that too. I, I know they they do so much. They're usually first on the scene. They were first on the scene, uh, uh, you know, with the Haiti disaster. So many national and world disasters. Israel many times is the first on the scene, and, and giving aid to anybody without prejudice of their religious or ethnic backgrounds. And of course, even on a commerce level. Uh, you know, with with, with uh, just the exports alone from the Dead Sea area, or or the world's largest uh, supplier of of floor of, of, of you know florist uh, flowers. Oh, unbelievable! I mean, it's just amazing uh, how God has continued to bless Israel and how Israel is a blessing all over the world, and people don't even know it. They just believe what they see or what they hear, and uh, many times they can't trust that. Well, I, I will also quote the, uh, the overquoted uh, Genesis 12, 3, which says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through all the nations, you know, uh, and, and through the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, all the nations will be blessed. And that's exactly what's happening. Um, you know, I have a, a, a firstly, to answer what you're saying, I remember many, many years ago, must have been 30 years ago, there was a major, major, or 50, 40 years ago, a major earthquake in Armenia in the Caucasus Mountains. I think 100,000 Armenians died in the earthquake. The Israelis showed up there. Uh, the Israelis always show up with uh, earthquakes, not only in Haiti, but in uh, other countries. Um, Israel is always ready to help in humanitarian issues. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going to pull a crazy uh, rabbit out of the hat. Um, you know that the I'm not going to venture my personal opinion about global warming, but yeah. the whole idea of the rising of the sea levels. Um, you know, I, I go back to where my father's house uh, is in, in Great Neck, New York, and uh, I go down to the uh, waterfront, and I, you know, over the last 70 years, I, I do not see any rise in the sea you know, in the Long Island Sound. Uh, I think what may be happening, areas that are going becoming submerged, they're simply sinking. Uh, you know, people are saying LaGuardia Airport, right across the bay from my father's house, uh, is sinking. You know, it's not that the level of the water is rising. But I will say that I think the solution to the rising level of the oceans, Israel should, you know, it, together with other countries in the world, should put up every 20, 30 miles a desalination plant along the coasts of all these desert countries and desalinate wow. the water, uh, use electricity that is harnessed from the sun, uh, you know, renewable energy, and turn all that ocean water into 
uh, potable water and our, our agricultural use. Turn all the deserts green, for heaven's sakes. This is something that, right. the, that the Jews are offering to the world. And I do know that there are certain countries, still hush-hush, that, that are putting up desalination plants with Israel's help. Wow. But because of money, because of politics, because of generational hatred, so many in the world deny themselves blessings that would be readily available from the Father and from Israel. What a travesty. But you know, uh, those who believe the prophecies and the scriptures, uh, they're just seeing this as, as just part of, uh, of history unfolding. I'm not sure where you stand with that, Avi, but you know what? We do need to have plenty of shows on Israel, on the situation uh, with the uh, very, very possible Holocaust of, of Jews in America. Uh, I know that you're an expert in, in those areas of radical Islam. And we need a lot more shows. But going back to the situation with with Ukraine and with Russia and Putin, and it almost sounds like there's an optimistic view of uh, of uh, the fall of communism if if things play out the way they continue to to appear. I don't know how how should how should Jews and Christians be praying right now? I think I know the answer. What would you say? Well, firstly, the fighting in the Ukraine has to stop. In other words, the Russians have to stop attacking. Uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to uh, uh, obliterate every city in the Ukraine? Are they going to kill everybody in the Ukraine? Uh, again, uh, look back to Putin's family in World War II, that his mother was given up for dead in a mound of bodies. The Ukrainians, many of the Ukrainians were pro-Nazi. And there are names which are horrible in the eyes of the Jewish people, like Belnitsky in 1648, who killed half a million Jews, or uh, Semyon Pitlura, who killed 100,000 Jews in the Russian Civil War in 1920, or the invasion of the Ukraine. Bandera was the Ukrainian nationalist who fought uh, uh, against the Soviets and alongside the Nazis. Uh, and so Ukrainians have a very bad record. But the last 20, 30 years have changed everything. And today, Ukrainians, even they voted for a Jewish president, and many of the, uh, President Zelensky's uh, uh, advisors, Zelensky's advisors, they're Jewish, but they're Ukrainian. And the Ukrainian people, like I said, they have computers, they know what's going on in the world, and they changed. Uh, listen, I used to hate Germans. Forgive right. me, I used to hate American Germans too. Right. And today I love Germans, you know, it started with Texas Germans. Today, I, the Germans I love the most are Texas Germans. But then well, I hey, went that's to, the, you know, Texas is the best of everything in America anyway. You got it right. So. Yeah. And I have a whole story <laughs> about that. And my book was translated into German. My first book is Fanatic Islam, a Global Threat. It was translated into German by Hensler Furlag, a German Christian publisher in Stuttgart. And um, today I love all Germans, but I, I will fight Nazism to my last breath. Right. And I love Russians, and I love Chinese, and I love everybody, but I'm going to fight communism. And I love the Muslims. But Islam is a system, first and foremost, they kill their own people, which is horrible. So I think that the um, problem here is not people. The problem is the ideologies, which are horrible. I support democracy. So democracy is the way to go, and the democracy is going to win. The problem is, will democracy eventually be controlled by the globalists? in which case it's the greatest dictatorship in human history. That's the plan. So, yeah, so, so therefore I'm, I'm very cautious on how I discuss uh, where the world is going now. But firstly, the fighting has to stop. The Russians have to stop killing, uh, irregardless of who the people are, stop killing children, stop killing you know, civilians, stop blowing up hospitals and museums and schools. Um, I heard today in the news that the German foreign ministry is already putting together a Marshall Plan of sorts to completely rebuild the Ukraine. So, I mean, you have a war, you rebuild. Uh, so we'll have to see how that develops. Uh, I, I just hope, see, the Russians have to get their act together. The Russians have to get rid of uh, Putin and get rid of the uh, authoritarian tyranny uh, that has ruled Russia for a thousand years. It is being said that a lot of Russian troops don't even know why they're there. And, and a lot of these people have relatives in the Ukraine. There's also 
my friend, Dr. Cindy Roman, as we speak, she's on the border of Poland and Ukraine, where uh, one child a second goes missing into human trafficking. They're, they're loading up vans, telling women and children that they're, they're there to help. And they're imprisoning them and forcing them into uh, the human uh, sex trafficking trade. Um, it, 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 it's a travesty. It needs to stop. What's the best thing that we can do as Americans that want to be informed? You know, Avi, you've been around GLC for a long time. GLC loves you. Its viewers love you. As far as I know, uh, God's Learning Channel is the last of its kind. Uncensored, must carry a Christian TV network. Uh, we're not going the way of these other Christian networks that are too afraid to offend uh, for money's sake. We want to, to speak the truth. And so... With all that said, I hope that we continue to attract an audience that is not made up of sheep, but of lions who want to take action and want to be well-informed uh, with the truth. What what can a proactive uh, Jewish uh, person, Christian person, what can proactive people do specifically to help you in your efforts in this moment? Well, uh, as you probably know, I have uh, founded a Judeo-Christian Western Civilization and Democracy Party in Israel called the Bible Block. And, uh, you know, we uh, need 144,000 votes or 140,000 votes plus minus uh, to get across the threshold with four uh, deputies, four members of Knesset. And uh, we've run in four elections already. Uh, we had a dismal turnout because we're very new. We have really no budget at all. Um, and uh, we need 140,000 people. Now, just so you should know who our potential voters are, the Russian speakers today uh, who are not Jewish, according to the rabbis, uh, in other words, people whose father might be Jewish, the mother is Christian, so the kids are Christian, um, we have 400,000 today in Israel. I need 140,000. So just a third of that would get our first four candidates into the okay. Knesset. Then we have your uh, Ethiopians, so many of whom, tens of thousands of the 150,000 are Christian believers. We have two candidates who are Christian believers from the Ethiopian community. And now we're going to have all these tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of Jews and Christians coming from Ukraine and Russia. And this is my primary concern. Uh, and then finally, this Holocaust that I believe is gonna happen in America very soon, uh, may bring about the immigration to Israel of about six million Jews and four million Christian spouses and children. Now the ultra-Orthodox rabbis are freaking out when they hear me say these things. But the point is, you know, God, I, I believe, wants Jews and Christians uh, standing together on the Mount of Olives when the Messiah shows up. Uh, forgive me for saying it, but it doesn't matter to me if it's the first time or the second time. Uh, the, but the bottom line is the Messiah is not coming only for the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. He's coming for everybody. <laughs> and, oh, I always like to say in the Baptist churches, he's not coming only for the Southern Baptists. Um, right. Uh, and you know, of course, Northern Baptists go to hell. You know that. You know, <laughs> that that's a I grew up Southern Baptist, so I know what you're saying. And, yeah. and then we we went on to what some would call Baptist Gospel. But yeah. it, it is it is past time that people come together in this hour. You know, Avi, you see good and you see evil all over the world, and evil has no problem being united, even even if they devour each other. No problem at all. But for some reason, God's children seem to have a problem uh, with being divided. And all too often, uh, on the surface, it may seem doctrine, but underneath the surface, it's all about the money, folks. So those who have a heart for the Father must come together uh, in spirit and in truth. Avi, I've always loved Israel my whole life. I've always loved God's people. And it's an honor to talk with you. And we have a little more time. You've got me really hungry, though to do more shows on not only the contribution uh, of Israel to the world that people need to know, but also this, as you say, this coming Holocaust uh, to American Jews. That's a very frightening thing even to mention. And we do have a little bit of time, Avi, but can you kind of give us a, some type of idea of where you're going with that? Uh, 
okay. uh, what to look out for. Is there okay. a, a book firstly, you have on this? Firstly, I have to commend you uh, because indeed, you know, uh, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or you know, all the others, they would never have me get up and say what I'm going to say now. Right. Uh, you have the courage and the integrity to hear uh, an idea that may be true, maybe is not true, but you're ready to listen to it. Now, I've been speaking in churches over the last 32 years, all over the world, uh, primarily United States and Canada. And in the summer of uh, 1999, I went up to Canada and I received a testimony from a lady who is a social worker, but she works with the Canadian police. At least that was, you know, 23 years ago. And the information I got was that the jihadists in Canada and the jihadists in America have a plan to kill all the Jews in America and Canada and their Christian spouses at a certain given moment when the orders are given. And for that purpose, I'm not talking about all Muslims. I'm talking about maybe 10% who get their salaries from the Middle East. And I've been talking about this ceaselessly for 24 years. Now, uh, after the killing of George Floyd, and of course we all condemn the killing of George Floyd, uh, when this question of defund the police uh, came up. Uh, so I was in Florida in the villages and I went to have dinner with a nationalist, you know, uh, militia man. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me from the outset, he's my admirer and uh, he, he, he admires everything I say and I do. And it's true, I'm a Jew, but, you know, like, I'm not like the Democrat Jews, you know. And uh, so we sat, we had a very jovial time for an hour, hour and a half. And then he asked me, what do you think about defund the police after the killing of uh, George Floyd? And I said, well, I think defund the police is a horrible thing because if you defund the police, you're gonna have killing and chaos. And he said to me, no, you don't understand. I said, what do you mean I don't understand? He says, well, you see, before the killing of George Floyd, the militias had th three million members. After the killing of George Floyd, there are 30 million militia members, and they're all armed. Wow. And he said, the first thing we're going to do when the, when the crisis comes and the civil war comes is we're going to kill all the Jews in what? America. I said, what? He said, yeah, the, the Democrats are, are, are communists. They're socialists. We're going to kill all the Jews. I, I said, firstly, I said, 30% of the Jews vote Trump. They're, they're nationalists. They're like, like the Christians. He said, well, you know, it's very hard to differentiate. We're going to kill the Jews, but not you, because you're like one of us. You know, you're, I'm with the Tea Parties, I'm with the militias, I'm with the Republicans, I'm with everybody. Of course, the only ones who won't invite me are the Democrats. Uh, anyway, so... That's a shocker. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so, so let's say the 30 million uh, militia people. But I would say maybe 90% maybe of them are good people who are just, you know, patriots and good Christians and good Jews. But if you have 10% of them, uh, means 3 million. And I say that there are 30 million Muslims, and so if you take 10% of that, that's 3 million. So you have 6 million people armed and ready to kill the Jews. You have got 6 million Jews. And the only people who don't have guns are the Jews. The Jews don't want to have guns because it goes against our character. Uh, then you have Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, they hate the Jews because Jews are slumlords, that's what they say. Uh, Antifa are Bolsheviks. They want to kill the Jews too. Everybody wants to kill the Jews. That's the one thing that everybody has in common. Now, do you think Fox News would allow me to get up and say that? Of course not. And Fox News is the, one, the only one I can semi-tolerate. And Fox News uh, has given millions to the other side too. People, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. So anyway, so I'm uh, kind of a, a, a lone uh, gun. You know, I'm a, kind of like a... a, lo a the Lone Ranger here, and uh, I want you to know, I don't want to mention names, but I wrote a letter to a very senior person in the Israeli government, and uh, after I, uh, a few weeks later, I left uh, to go to the States, and there was a very brief announcement on the news in Israel that the Israeli government has prepared an emergency plan to uh, uh, receive 750,000 Jews from America. So there, there are people in the Israeli government who understands that what's happening now in the Ukraine and in Russia is a foretaste of what is eventually going to happen in the United States. In other words, our population in Israel today is about 7 million Jews, half a million Christians or non-Jews. Uh, and that number is going to double, maybe triple. 
And if ISIS takes over in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and then they attack Israel, Israel's going to have to expand in all directions, and we will be needing that population that comes in, Jew and Christian. This is shocking because, you know, typically you associate anti-Semitism with the left. Uh, you know, it's, it, it amazes me that Jews still vote Democrat when there's uh, the, the jihadi five uh, in the White House and, and uh, all this an anti-Semitic speech. Uh, you know, the, the ones who yell racist the loudest are the ones who are the racist, it seems. Uh, but, but, it, but just to hear that militias... Uh, and, and, and you're saying that right wing ultra ultra nationalist right wing. In other words, people who are, are close to neo Nazi. Because see, Trump, there was such celebration when he finally did what what no other president had the guts to do with the embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, a, a lot of celebration there, a lot of camaraderie among those who call themselves believers and those who say they love. Uh, the, the Jews and the love Israel. Wow. So is not true and positive and fearless media a major answer to this problem? Ha has not the media uh, helped this country to arrive where it is, you know, with, with all the wag the dogs, uh, sin, uh, you know, situations through the decades? And, and uh, uh, it, I can't help but think that media, true and positive, courageous media, has to be a, a solution or one of the one of the solutions to this ignorance and this misinformation. What do you say, Avi? Well, uh, like I said before, uh, you have a tradition in the Jewish world of being universalists. We are many of the Jewish people who are liberals. I'm not talking about the Orthodox Jews. I'm talking about a reformed conservative and unaffiliated. Uh, are uh, many of them are either you know not religious at all and don't care, or they're actually anti-God, uh, because it is God who caused all the anti-Semitic persecution throughout history. Uh, if you abolish God, you then you abolish the the hatred. That is the ideology of the Communist Socialist Party. And so you know when I was a young kid, I used to hate Christians, and right. when I saw you know a, 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 a cross on top of a, a steeple. Right. I wanted to blow up the church. Now right. I see a cross on a steeple. I say, is that a church I've spoken in or is that a church I'm going to speak in? <laughs> but, you know, most American Jews have never stepped into a church. Most right. American Jews have never read the Bible, Jewish or Christian or otherwise. Uh, and so because of the ignorance, people just stick to the, you know, no God, no religion. Uh, we're going to be liberals and we're going to be universalists. Whereas the Christians are nationalists. And all these wars that happened in Europe in the 1920s and 30s between fascists and Nazis on the one hand and communists and socialists on the other hand, you wouldn't find Jews in the fascist and uh, Nazi parties. You'd find them in the socialist and communist parties. And uh, something about the Ukraine, which I think is very important, uh, because the Ukrainians wholesale slaughtered the Jews for 500 years, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, commissars in the Soviet uh, uh, Red Red Army, Red Party, Communist Party, uh, they starved tens of millions of Russians and Ukrainians who were known to be anti-Semites. That was the vengeance of the Communist Party because the Ukrainians believed in God. And so I'm just saying there's a lot of bad history. Uh, revenge goes in both directions. When I spoke in Warsaw, Poland, and they were saying to me, you Jews were the communists. I said, of course we were the communists because you were the Catholics and you were killing us. And so the Communist Party, led by the Jews, you know, came back to Poland and Ukraine and took out vengeance. So what I'm saying is all of this hatred and vengeance has to stop. And the, the only solution is democracy. And I know we're coming close to the end of the program, and I wanted to make a very important quote from Alexis de Tocqueville in his, book, in his book written in 1840, Democracy in America. And he said, America will be the greatest country on earth because the American people are a good people and their pulpits are on fire for the Lord. And conversely, when America's pulpits are no longer on fire for the Lord, America will lose its preeminence in the world. And I want to ask you, has America ever killed one Jew? America never killed one Jew. No. Uh, Russia, Poland, Ukraine, all, Germany, uh, Spain, all, England, everybody killed the Jews. Uh, you, you know, obviously my hesitancy was that America did, not, not Americans, but the government did turn away 
uh, Jews during the Holocaust at one point. The, but th those you know, are outside Jews. I'm talking about Jews living in America were not slaughtered. Right, right. Okay, now, of course, uh, I always teach about the St. Louis, you know, the ship that was carrying 900 refugees from Nazi Europe, Nazi right. Germany. And, uh, uh, you know, by the way, Roosevelt, <laughs> he was a Democrat. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say another thing also, you know, I just came from Israel two weeks ago, and one of the things we're talking about is that as soon as this war is over in the Ukraine and Ru with Russia, uh, Biden is going to clamp down on Israel regarding the settlements. Oh, of course. Of course. That's what that's what he's what he's uh, uh, he's not in control. <laughs> he, we're, I personally think we're in Obama's third term, I mean, so of course, you know, he's just going to read what's on the teleprompter, bless his heart. But yeah. it always it always goes that way with the Democrat. Party. Well, let me you know, tell you, we in Israel are waiting are waiting for the next uh, elections in November. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned Sisi earlier in Egypt, and I tell you what, the whole world is hoping that our next president is not a Democrat for a lot of good reasons. And uh, unfortunately, so many Americans vote the way their mama voted or their grandfather voted, uh, ignorant of the fact of the history of the KKK, Jim Crow laws, uh, slavery, Native American genocide, and the list goes on and on. It, pretty much every scourge of our nation has come from one side. Uh, but there's a lot of confusion right now uh, because now they all have lunch together in DC, you know, uh, during their breaks. And so what do you do? That's why it's so important that we have true and positive, accurate and fearless media I know you've been sounding the trumpet for a long time, Avi. What can GLC do? And what can our viewers do? Uh, I've asked you it before, and I know I'm asking it again. Uh, you said we have to be informed. We need to pray. We need to come together. Uh, you can't get rid of hate as long as uh, as the Messiah is not here on the, on the earth. What What's something else that we can do besides be informed and inform each other and pray and come together? What else can we do? Well, uh, one of the things I've been suggesting in the Christian world uh, in the churches is that I remember when I was a young kid, I would go to school, public school, from eight to three. From three to five, I'd go to intramurals uh, sports. And then from five to seven, I'd go to Hebrew school privately. Right. And uh, a lot of holes of knowledge were filled up in Hebrew school. I think that the churches in America uh, should have an afternoon school program with qualified teachers to teach the real history about America and about Christianity or right. Judeo-Christianity. Uh, the churches, I think, are getting off easy. Uh, I mean, it's good to have Bible study every so often, but there should be afternoon classes every day in the churches and that kids go to school in the morning, then they go to church, and then they study the real history of America. And indeed, as you know, as Alexis de Tocqueville said, America will be the greatest country on earth because the Americans are good people and their pulpits are on fire for the Lord. We've got to get the young people fired up and we've got to fight the corruption. We've got to fight the ignorance. And that's the role of the pastors in the churches. It, it, it's supposed to be the role. And, and for many, it is. But for a lot, it's become a self-help Starbucks rock concert Disneyland franchise. See, again, one of the things I'm trying to say here is that the uh, people in America uh, have been dumbed down uh, all these decades. Uh, I don't know if you saw, I'm sure you saw the clip about Khrushchev in 1960, and he was saying, your children and your children's children will start with socialism and then they will end up with communism. And what happened was in the 1920s, um, when the Nazis came to power and, and the Italian fascists came to power and other fascist countries came to power, uh, there were two uh, communist schools of thought in Germany. You had the Leipzig School and the Frankfurt School. And all these professors emigrated to the United States. And uh, they all got jobs in the American universities. And so what has happened is the universities over the decades got taken over by these communists. And uh, so what happened eventually, once you control the universities, you control the minds of the young people. And so uh, the only way to counter, counter that is through the churches, because, you know, theoretically, communists and socialists cannot take over the, the churches. So I think the key to America is, <laughs> this is funny, I'm a Jew, I'm telling you to strengthen your churches 
strengthen your Christianity. Uh, I love you too, brother. I love you too, man. <laughs> uh, that's what made America great. And uh, I think it's important for Jews to understand that, uh, not to hate the Christians anymore. Uh, again, don't forget, American Christians never killed the Jews uh, here in yeah. America. And uh, the European Christians did. The European Christians have also come a long way. And so I think in the end, uh, this war in Ukraine has to end. Um, I think uh, Putin will be terminated. Uh, I mean, it hurts me to say it because personally, per Putin is a friend of the Jews. Uh, right. What might happen is um, uh, the oligarchs that come in after him or the generals that come after him might not be so friendly to the Jews. But again, right. that in the end will mean more and more Jews will move to Israel. So you believe that this is beyond Putin having a change of action and a change of, of heart, that he, he needs to, to go? Uh, I think it's not a question if he needs to go. Of course he needs to go. But the question is, will he go quietly, gracefully, and peacefully, or will he be terminated by yeah. a general or oligarchs or you know, a general uprising? You know, some people are concerned that, uh, you know, there's an old saying, Avi, in Texas, uh, don't fight a man who's got nothing to lose. Um, there's a concern to what he may result to if he is backed into a corner and feels he has nothing to lose. Well, you know, again, uh, I'm a little older than you. And I remember in 1960, a little bit before your time, there was a book that was required reading uh, in school. It was called On the Beach. Did you ever read that book? No. Your generation, nobody read the book, but it was about a, an atomic cataclysm, a, a collection of wars in which dozens of countries started nuking each other, and then the whole world got so polluted and contaminated with radiation that the whole human race died. Wow. And uh, I pray to God it doesn't happen. But the thing is, I, I, I think it's very sad that American people younger than 70 or 60, you know, like me, um, Americans never read the book on the beach. And it's something, maybe it's something also that should be read in the churches. It should. You, you know, you mentioned churches, Avi, and um, a lot of Americans, and I would dare say most Christians are not even aware of the fact that our Constitution uh, is based on the sermon notes of the Black Robe Regiment outlaw preachers uh, that were preaching uh, justice and liberty and personal freedom. And, and King George wanted them dead. He called for their deaths. Um, John Hancock compiled a lot of those sermon notes and, and others too. Samuel Adams as well. He wanted to be a preacher, but his dad told him to go into politics after hearing him preach the first time. But a lot of Americans and a lot of Christians and a lot of churches, a lot of pastors aren't even aware that our constitution is pretty much just a collection of those sermons from the Black Robe Regiment, those fearless outlaw preachers uh, that wanted to see justice for all and wanted to see freedom. And we need to be reminded of that. And so I appreciate who you are and your encouragement as well. You know, you have every reason uh, to, to not love uh, Christians and, and to not love uh, uh, churches that perhaps have slipped into this replacement theology and, and things that, that diminish the roles of Israel. But for those of us believers who love God's people and love Israel, uh, we are honored each and every time to talk to people just like you. And of course, GLC loves you, Avi, and your son, Aaron. We want to do more shows together uh, about all the wonderful things you have to say, as well as the warnings that you have uh, for America. So I'm honored to, to talk to you, Avi, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you for being with us today. God save America and God save Israel and the world. Yes, sir. And God bless you folks. We'll see you next time. <laughs>